All right, before we get into the full conversation here, I want you each to have a chance to give a little bit of context about what housing affordability pr problems look like in your particular area. So Maria, I want to start with you. What does this look like in New York? Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's terrific. Thank you very much for having us, and in particular for making sure this part of this conversation, the view outside of Washington, D.C., the view from the field, in my case, the view from New York City is part of the conversation. And I have to say, at this moment in time, and in our history, um, the view from New York, uh, there's actually a lot to be um, both heartened by, but also um, frightened about. And I say that because the crisis that we are facing in New York City, um, you know, it's a story that we see across the country. You know, of course, we have been um, suffering from a housing emergency since, the since 1974. Um, this is a crisis, however, that's taken on different forms over the course of the last few decades. We've dealt with physical um, devastation, financial devastation. What we're seeing today is crisis of um, a different kind, Cr a crisis that's born in many ways from the hard-fought successes of our city in terms of being now um, at a point where we're seeing record population growth, record job growth, but still way too many families that are rent burdened and in too many cases severely rent burdened and in too many cases just one unforeseen event away, a family illness, um, job loss, uh, a reduction in hours even for full-time workers, just one unforeseen event away from um, homelessness and, and total devastation. And so what that has meant, just to start off for us, um, is really a doubling down in terms of what we need to do on the community level, on the municipal level, to really address the affordability crisis. And so Mayor Bill de Blasio, um, there were four years into his term, we set out with a goal of um, building or preserving 200,000 homes over the course of um, 10 years. We've accelerated that plan and expanded that plan. And so what we now have um, in our new housing plan is a goal of uh, building or preserving 300,000 homes over the course of 12 years. Uh, but more so than, than numbers, what that is for us is an acknowledgement not just that we have to do everything that we can to solve this crisis, but we really need to grapple as a city with um, really the question of what kind of city do we want to be, not just today, but for the future. Matthew, what are you guys dealing with? Thank you. Um, we uh, in the state of Maryland have, uh, the, the economy is really growing, it's really doing well. We have uh, great job growth. And uh, you know, so we have, uh, I think, really three areas uh, where we're focused on different housing strategies. We have rural Maryland on the eastern shore, southern Maryland, and, and in, the, uh, in the western part of the state. And uh, then we have some high cost areas between Baltimore and Washington, and of course the city of Baltimore. And they all have their own uh, challenges and, and strengths. And so we're trying to build on that to really make sure that we're creating uh, a housing environment, a housing market uh, that is uh, thriving and healthy uh, from home ownership uh, through the rental continuum and, uh, and focused on, on uh, uh, helping uh, even the homeless. Uh, we're focusing on, on homeless veterans and homeless families. And um, it, we, have, we have some challenges, but in general, I think that the housing market in, in Maryland is very strong, and so we have some, some real strengths to build from. Um, thank you. Allison? Oh, thanks, Jillian. You know, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thanks to The Atlantic to, for having this event and for the sponsors who make this happen. You know, in D.C., you know, we are faced with a very similar challenges as the other two jurisdictions here in New York and Maryland. You know, we look at our cost of housing. It's about $2,200 a month um, in rent. That's what we're seeing lately. And our sales prices are about $570,000 uh, to buy a house in our city. And so we're really grappling with how do we figure out ways um, to create home ownership pathways to our middle class. You know, uh, also figure out how we ensure we have an inclusive city here. We really want to build in a balanced way. Um, while we're really excited about the economic benefit and also the families that are moving into our city, we know that there's generations of families who have lived here, and we need to figure out how they can stay in their homes too. Um, so we look at things, whether it's um, home ownership, uh, rental housing production and preservation, um, and a lot of different tools that I hope we'll get to talk about today. So excited to be here. Absolutely. So both of you talked a little bit about the kind of difficult 
space of having a city that is growing, where there are lots of new people moving in, but also you have to worry about issues of displacement, cost rising. I'm wondering when you think about setting out a framework for housing affordability, who do you think the primary onus is on? When I report on these issues a lot, people talk about inclusionary zoning, and then the issue comes up that people say inclusionary zoning on its own is woefully insufficient because it puts a lot of the burden of doing this on actually private developers, and it's predicated on whether or not they are actually building. So I'm wondering who you guys think the onus is on and whether or not you think inclusionary zoning should be a big piece of the puzzle or a small piece of the puzzle. Well, I think for, for us in New York, it starts off by not falling to the trap of thinking there you have to make a choice between growth and inclusion. Um, and it, it is always a delicate balancing act, but we believe in the plan that we have um, is one of inclusive growth. And, but what that means is that everyone um, has to play a part in this. So for instance, you mentioned um, in, in uh, inclusionary housing, inclusionary zoning, um, we recently passed what we think is the most aggressive uh, mandatory inclusionary housing regime in the entire country. So now anytime an area, uh, a site is being rezoned for residential growth, um, the develop uh, developers have to build affordable housing anywhere from 25 to 30 percent. Um, we've uh, uh, also instituted a number of other policy and zoning tools so that we can extract more um, uh, from uh, uh, players in the system in order to get more affordability. But the onus is not just on um, the private sector. Um, we have to, um, as a public sector, also put our money where our mouth is. And so in New York, you know, this admin in the administration, the city administration in New York, we have a capital plan um, in service of, of uh, the housing plan that's about $13 billion over the course of, of those 12 years. Um, and we also have to make sure that we work with communities, because I think part of what we have experienced and what is just the reality is that there is no silver bullet to the affordability crisis that this country is facing. And in fact, it's not just, um, there is no one tool to fix the housing situation, but the, the affordability crisis that we, that we face is not just about housing, it's certainly also about employment, it's about infrastructure. And so the onus falls on everyone, but it's really the kind of responsibility um, of doing so falls on everyone. The good news, and which I'll end with on this point, is that the affordable housing community, affordable housing industry, is the best example, I think, in, in this entire country of public-private partnership, of the type of model for every city um, dollar that we spend, we leverage over five dollars in state, federal, and private. That's a model that works, which is all the more reason why it's so disappointing and so, um, and it makes so many people angry, but we don't despair um, that a lot of these resources on the federal level are today under, um, under attack. Um, yes, I think I would completely agree that it's all of our responsibilities. You know, I kind of think <coughs> about it in three ways, like um, leadership, so we need leadership, which I'll talk about. We need to have an action plan, so we need to have steps in which we're going to use to uh, actually create and preserve affordable housing. But then we also have to react, um, because sometimes that action plan may need to be adjusted along the way, like we have been, I know, in the last few years, so, and especially in the coming months. Um, but you know, in DC, um, we have a mayor that invests $100 million, which is two times more than her predecessors have done. And so that $100 million it helps us produce and preserve affordable housing. But we know that is not the only thing that we need to do. So we've also created a preservation fund, which is a new public-private partnership tool that will use $10 million of local funds, and we want to leverage it to up to $40 million, so we have a fund that will be $40 million. And so um, aside from inclusionary zoning, we do have to have other tools in that toolbox so that we can figure out what this action plan looks like. Um, at the end of the day, um, we all are trying to figure out how to produce these units for our families, and we still have to figure out what the federal government's going to do. What's the, what does that landscape look like, and how do we adjust um, and react to that? I could just, you know, it, it's a, it's a great point, but it, for us on the state level, uh, last round of our tax credit allocation, 90% of our allocations were in communities of opportunity. You know, so, you know, what we're trying to do with our rental housing development is, is you know, get to communities where there are good schools and uh, good jobs and, and good communities for people to live in. Um, and so that's really important to us and, and uh, a, a strategy that we set out to accomplish and, and I think the results are, 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 are there. 
um, you know, at the same time, we're using other products, uh, other, other programs and funding to ensure that, uh, you know, we are preserving and um, uh, uh, investing in, in Baltimore, uh, the, the city that, uh, in Maryland, that, that has, uh, you know, a great need as well. And, and so we're, we're trying to accomplish both. And, um, you know, you can look at inclusionary zoning, but, uh, you know, other strategies at the statewide level uh, to make sure that we're creating uh, mixed uh, income and you know very very healthy communities across the board. Austin, you brought up coming upcoming changes uh, in federal policy. I'm wondering if you could expand on some of the things that you're most concerned about in terms of federal changes that would in, would that would affect housing. Oh, thanks. I think all of us probably in the room are, are worried about the same things. Uh, you know, private activity bonds. You know, are they going to stay? Uh, how is the impact going to be on low-income housing tax credit, that equity that we really need to produce and pre preserve these units? And I think that, you know, still CDBG and home, you know, we might be safe for a little while, but we never know what will happen in the future. So I think uh, for us in the city, um, our mayor, our D.C. Housing Finance Agency, they just this week announced that they're going to um, come up with this solution, which is they're going to issue $500 million of bonds. Um, in before the end of the calendar year. And that's gonna help us preserve those private activity bonds um, into the future. So it's such an exciting thing that we're trying to be reactionary. So that was that reactionary aspect I was talking about earlier. And so we know that while we may have these uh, um, bonds um, into the future, but who knows what the Senate and the House will do. So fingers crossed. Yeah. Are you guys worried about similar issues? Of, of course we are, uh, and, and similarly, uh, I actually think of it as, as, as being proactive um, rather than reactive maybe, but uh, uh, we also are, are, are intending to, to issue bonds both on the single family and multifamily side uh, before the end of the year. Uh, the Hogan administration uh, really looks at that as a way to safeguard our uh, production of 4% tax credits uh, for the, the next several years. Um, I think it's very proactive. I think it's a way for us to maintain um, uh, it's sort of in, in the, in the, in the scenario where we, we lose private activity bonds uh, to continue our production until we can find another way uh, to, uh, to make it all work. Uh, in the state of Maryland, it's a, uh, the 4% program is about half of our, of our affordable housing uh, production. And so it, it, it is a significant um, impact. Uh, other states perhaps not as much, but in Maryland certainly it is. Um, what I think we've experienced, and as so many others probably in this room have experienced, is that there, there's something that is happening in this country that seems to amount to, frankly, a war on affordable housing. Um, and it's one that um, uh, makes a lot of us lose sleep. I mean, earlier in the year, it was potentially the complete elimination of CDBG and um, home monies. Um, maybe it would have been, then it became potentially reduction in um, Section 8 and other rental subsidies, and of course, most recently, with tax reform, private activity bonds, and housing credit, and others. And we all know, and the work that we do, pulling together the funding that's necessary, not just to construct a building, but to ensure that it is sustainable over time, let alone stabilizing entire neighborhoods, it takes all of that. And the experience has been every other day is yet another attack on a critical tool. And so I, I mention all of that, not to continue to depress people in this room, um, but because um, uh, 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 hopefully um, this will continue to um, build what is a growing coalition in this country, which is a very good sign, I think, um, of people who recognize that affordable housing um, is it's not a New York City issue versus a uh, rural issue. It's, it's really a bipartisan issue. I mean, in no state in this country can um, a person make it, working full time at the federal minimum wage afford a two bedroom apartment at fair market rent, but nowhere. Um, and, that's the, and, and that's the type of statistic that will hopefully, hopefully continue to galvanize all of those who are part of this community um, not just to save every program as it is coming under attack, but to find a way to also call for more resources. This is a time when we need more and not less, and to make sure that all partners in government don't walk away from their obligation to make sure that access to a safe and decent home um, is one that is within reach of everyday Americans. 
I want to continue down what is perhaps a depressing line of questioning. <laughs> um, but as someone who covers this issue a lot, the thing that I find really frustrating is that on one side, as you said, New York City has been in a housing emergency since the 1970s. So this is not a new problem. And then we look at cities that have recently been revitalized, places like Durham, where I do a lot of reporting, and they literally courted that economic development, watched it happen, and now have a housing crisis that they were ill-equipped to deal with. And the question that I keep running into is, how on earth have all of these cities around the country not learned from one another? How is this a problem that we keep having again and again and again, and yet there seem to be no viable solutions that can be implemented ahead of time and proactively? It seems like it's always reactionary after there's a problem. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you guys think there is a particular reason for that, um, or if there are places where you're seeing promising proactive policies. Maria, I want to start with you. Sure. Um, well, in, I think what we've seen in demographic shifts um, are people who want to more and more live and work in urban areas, um, and that is um, that wasn't uh, that wasn't a foregone conclusion just a few decades ago, right? Um, now, as um, it, it, it's been important for us, and, and I think we went from uh, what I mentioned before of you know financial devastation to stability. Um, but not enough families themselves became stable enough given that growth. I think it's important, therefore, and uh, to, to not always be kind of behind the market. Mm -hmm. And so policies like mandatory inclusionary um, housing, policies like increasing supply through, um, uh, through other zoning mechanisms, making the investments today um, for generations into the future critically important. Um, but it also has to be work, in my opinion, not just of constructing buildings. And so we've done a lot recently in New York City um, that is about services to people to prevent displacement. So universal access, for instance, to legal services. If you're facing eviction in housing court, traditionally, the landlords are lawyered up and, and, and people who are facing eviction did not have that type of assistance. Now there's universal access to that for low-income families in New York City. And so we have to think about the work and a number of other policy programs to kind of, as much as we can, even though government can be slow, to get ahead of the speculation, to be able to compete in the market. And, and those are tools that um, every city is doing that. And I think there has to be, to your point, um, you know, one, kind of more sharing of it, two, more investment um, in it, um, and, and that investment coming from different levels of government. I, I agree. I, I think it's, the, the problems change. And, and so, you know, you're sort of always chasing the next problem. Um, and so, you know, being a victim of success is, is a great thing in some ways, but also brings up other challenges. Uh, so, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a matter of change. And, and again, when I, when I started, I talked about sort of the three challenges that we have in different areas of the state of Maryland. Um, you know, it, different strategies uh, work for different challenges. And so it may look like we're chasing uh, the, uh, you know, each other um, in terms of, of, of uh, making this work, but we, there's always more to do and there are never enough resources. And so we're always reacting and we're always trying to get to, uh, you know, solve the problem that's in front of us that, that day. So. One of the things that I think is interesting when we talk about the issue of housing affordability and also building affordable units is that it's not just a capacity issue, right? It's where we are building these things and an issue of con concentrated poverty has become a hot topic of conversation. I wanna know how you guys are thinking about solving that issue in your particular areas. And Matthew, I wanna start with you because I know Maryland has had a little bit of an issue with this. Sure. Well, as I said, uh, you know, we made a, a decision that we wanted to make sure that we were investing our tax credit uh, allocations in communities of opportunity, and, and we did that with our last round. You know, I would I, I think that the general consensus is that um, you know through the the qualified allocation plan, with the policy uh, included in, in the qualified allocation plan, um, you know, you are sort of on a pendulum, and perhaps our pendulum swung a little too far. Um, and we need to bring that towards the middle, but our goal is to do both. You know, our, our goal is to create new opportunities for affordable housing and communities of opportunity, while not um, ignoring, uh, you know, the, 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 the power that the tax credit can have in terms of uh, reinvestment and revitalization of, of, of our older communities. Um, and, um, and so we want to make sure that we, we do both. Uh, the tax credit program is a powerful tool. Uh, both uh, on the new creation side, but we know that when we invest in preservation of affordable rental housing, the surrounding uh, home values increase, and it can really be an, uh, a, a great 
mechanism for uh, starting to turn around neighborhoods that, that need that. Um, so our goal is, is to, uh, through both the, the, the creation of, of, of rental um, and, and then you know, to look through also the continuum, you know, make sure that we're investing in home ownership opportunities in those same neighborhoods. Um, and uh, that you know, we go beyond housing, that we're going into uh, you know, creating small businesses and uh, opportunities for entrepreneurship. Uh, that you know, we're really taking a holistic look at, at, at the community. And our, our slice of that is, is housing plus, um, but um, that, that, that it is a, a wide angle view. Allison, how are you thinking about issues of concentrated poverty? You know, I think in D.C., as we look at the built environment um, of our city and where uh, development is occurring, whether it's near metro stations, um, whether it's land that the District of Columbia owns, or, um, or how are we developing um, our city, I think that it's important for us to also focus on making sure that there's affordable options for people so that they have choice. Um, and so that's something I think um, one of the tools we're using is using our land as a tool for building affordable housing. So our deputy mayor for planning and economic development's office, they have a 30% requirement on their land dispositions. So every land disposition that they do has 30% affordable housing requirement on the disposition. Now, and that's different because that's not pro property that's owned by the department, it's property that's owned by economic development office. So I think if we start thinking about it from that perspective that affordable housing is also an economic development engine, then we'll be able to look at ways that we're more inclusive um, as opposed to concentrating poverty. Well, one of the challenges of that, of course, you know, you can build uh, affordable rental in a community of opportunity, but if people aren't willing to move there, it doesn't work. You know, so I think education and, and making sure that people understand the benefits of moving to an area with good schools, um, you know, and, and you know, what impact that can have on their family uh, over generations is, is really important. And that's a piece that is often lost. We think that if we build it, they will come, uh, but it has to be more than that. You know, we have to make sure that we are also helping people understand the, the benefits of, of, of moving to those communities of opportunity and, and help them to do that. Uh, sometimes that's, that's leaving a network of support that they have, um, that they've always had, and, and that can be really hard, uh, but um, you know, it can be a great thing for them and their family and their kids too. Um, to tackle it head on, our approach has been to um, be very balanced in the investments that we make that are about people and about places. And so um, when I mentioned earlier areas that we are rezoning, um, a, a number of those areas, not all, but a number of those areas are neighborhoods in New York City that have historically been underinvested in. And so the goal there is to make sure not just that we're changing the zoning to um, increase capacity, but we are making those investments in parks, community centers, sewers, um, schools um, that are needed so that uh, people can thrive in place and, and can feel um, that with the changes that are happening, zoning or otherwise, that the communities um, are still for them. Um, and that is, uh, for too many New Yorkers, the, the feeling is that the city is slipping away from them, and this is a city that they love and help build. At the same time, in places that are um, higher growth, higher opportunity, um, like places in Manhattan, for instance, there are um, uh, mandatory inclusionary housing um, is a way to ensure that whenever a building gets built where the, we need it to change, to, to increase the zoning, um, then we get affordable housing. Um, and so making, and, and it, but it requires real intentionality um, in terms of the, the disposition of, of city-owned land, um, the use of the resources, and then the advancement of those zoning policies um, that ensure that people have um, uh, the ability to thrive in place, um, but also um, can be, um, have a choice um, in where they are. And I absolutely agree that part of this is to make sure that we continue to invest in, in infrastructure and in transportation. Um, um, so that um, uh, the, the job centers um, are, are ones, you know, for us, not just in the historical core of, of say, Manhattan and other, in, in other areas, um, but it truly becomes a five borough economy. We're gonna come to the audience for questions in just a second or two, so again, think about them, condense them all the way down, make sure they're questions, and we'll be coming right back to you. So, Alton and Matthew, We've covered a lot of issues of blight, vacant homes in Maryland and in DC. And I think the thing that is really difficult for a lot of people to understand is how places have a housing affordability crisis, a homelessness crisis, and a ton of vacant buildings sitting around. So can you talk about how um, both of your localities are trying to tackle that? 
Sure, uh, definitely. It's, you know, we looked at um, our inventory and we have about 90 sites in DC that we own that are vacant and blighted. Um, about half of them are actually going through a disposition process right now. And so we feel proud that we're able to bring these properties back into productive use. You know, then we had some, I don't know, how would you say, uh, uh, just more challenging sites like infill sites, uh, sites that had bad topography, ones that had you know uh, metro um, tunnels running under them that were just going to be that much more difficult to develop. And so we've been really trying to figure out how do we develop a better plan to dispose of those properties because they're just not that attractive uh, to the development community uh, because there's so many other um, approval processes that they have to go through. So um, it is difficult, but I think that we've made great strides, and you know um, we have. Have made a, a goal so stay tuned everybody I won't give it away um, but we've made a goal that we're gonna have a plan that's gonna dispose of the other half of those properties by the end of the year uh, so we'll look forward to hearing from that um, from us um, in, in, the, in the near term. <coughs> Governor Hogan uh, started a program called Project Core uh, that is uh, uh, working with the city to um, acquire and demolish vacant and abandoned properties uh, and to stabilize stabilize them when, when it, it makes sense. Uh, it's, a, it's a program that has been incredibly successful to bring down thousands of units. Um, and uh, so, you know, about 40, 50 years ago, the city of Baltimore was around a million people. Now it's around 650 and it's starting to grow again. Uh, but we have an oversupply of housing. It just isn't um, in the right places and in the right styles uh, that, that people are asking for today. So we're, we're creating um, uh, opportunities for redevelopment uh, through Project Core by demolishing uh, old and, and vacant abandoned properties and providing opportunities for new development uh, on those sites. But when you look at the economics of new development, uh, preparing the land is, is a big piece of that and that's what Project Core is accomplishing. All right, we're going to go to the audience for questions. If you have them, we'll raise those hands high. One right here. Uh, yes, um, I'm Ibrahim Mukman, and I'm an economic development consultant here in Washington. I, I live in the Shaw neighborhood, and when I moved there 40 years ago, it was a blighted neighborhood, but now it's gentrified. I'm doing some volunteer work, Allison, in um, Anacostia. And my question is, what are you doing, uh, what kind of strategy does the housing department have so that uh, Anacostia doesn't become another Shaw in 15 years? Oh, great question. I think I'll start with uh, from a personal perspective. I think it's incumbent upon all of us to respect the community. Uh, we need to really understand the history, the heritage, um, and also be able to figure out how to balance any um, new development that's happening in that community. So first, I think it starts with respect. Um, and I think if we start as that as a basis, um, we should be able to work together um, and have a lot of community engagement um, with the neighbors so we understand what they would like to see. Um, from my understanding and working with um, families in Anacostia, there is uh, two different camps, so to speak. There are some families that want to see uh, more affordable housing um, be there uh, built in the neighborhood. And in other cases, they want to see market rate housing because they want to see their, they might be homeowners and they want to see their um, housing uh, investment grow. And so I think that that's a difficult thing, but we have to have that community engagement um, as a second tool. And I think the last thing is, is, is to be honest. Um, we have to be straightforward with what we're trying to accomplish in the community and we have to listen. And so, and I think that amongst all the other tools that we have, which are more the techniques and the uh, um, funding sources that are there, um, if we start there, I think we have um, a good chance of success. All right, and I think we have a question right over there. Uh, my name's Kate uh, Winger. I work for HUD. I'm not speaking for HUD. Um, I oftentimes have a feeling that we do things horribly wrong in the federal government. The one reason I say this, um, when I go to work, when I go to lunch, I don't know what ward I'm in. I sometimes don't know what state I'm in. When we award our money, not because I don't know what's going on, but uh, that, just trying to make a point. Uh, when we award our money, the way that we slice and dice those awards do not necessarily reflect how I live and work or how I um, relate in the, you know, the DMV space. I, mean, I think the Metro is a primary example for this. My question to you is anyone making a call uh, to evaluate how HUD, Department of Transportation, SBA, all of these other grant and award processes or awarding scores are happening, is there anything that we 
in that space could be doing better for you so that we could serve your needs timely so that you get $40 and $90 in the same year so that you can actually move things forward. All right, this is a gold mine one. What do you guys want from HUD? <laughs> <laughs> Maria, you want to start? Sure. I mean, there's, um, there's probably, and I will follow up with you, um, because there's, uh, there, there's, no, there's no shortage of, um, of regulations or rules that e each and every one is well-intentioned, but the accumulation of which makes it very difficult to spend the money, um, and then you get dinged for not spending the money when if we just made that change, and I'll tell you about what that change needs to be, um, uh, then we wouldn't have had the problem in the first place. Uh, I think that the, the, the overall point that is also worth making here, however, and we deal with it too on the city or state level, is that a, a government is organized in silos, um, and funding sources are organized in silos. People's lives their problems don't happen in silos. There are interconnected problems of housing, jobs, health, for example. And the more that we as government and the more that not-for-profit organizations and partners think about what it means to have coordinated investments across sectors, the more we will get, the more we'll be able to stretch the dollar. Do you guys have anything to add to that or does that kind of cover it? That covers it very well. I, what, what we do have an initiative around uh, Washington, D.C., where we're coordinating between the state of Maryland, Virginia, and the, the district, and, and some surrounding counties to uh, you know, talk about these major projects and, and see how we all fit into them together. And so that's an example of, of sort of you know, regional co collaboration that, uh, that's very helpful. All right. Audience, please join me in thanking our panelists.